Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Ben Pink Dandelion. I'm part of the learning and research team uh, at Woodbrook. I look after the Center for Research in Quaker Studies, which along with the Quaker Studies Research Association co-sponsors this lecture. The George Richardson Lecture uh, was set up uh, in 1996 at the Center for Quaker Studies in University of Sunderland and is named after the uh, Northeast England Quaker, George Richardson, grocer and active evangelical friend, uh, active in the anti-slavery movement and the home mission movement. It's an annual lecture. Um, we like to think of it as a prestigious annual lecture in Quaker studies uh, given by someone working at professorial level. And the, this year, it's a great privilege and personal uh, pleasure for me to welcome uh, Hugh Piper, uh, recently retired professor of biblical interpretation at the University of Sheffield. Hugh was due to give the lecture in 2020 and has waited a year. Thank you very much, Hugh, uh, to, to, to deliver the, the, the talk he's going to give this evening. Uh, we are recording this, um, and so it will later be available on the Woodbrook website, and also a text of the lecture will appear in a forthcoming issue of Quaker Studies. Hugh has written numerous books, um, a scandalous text, sorry, a, a bigger pardon, uh, the unsuitable book, The Bible is Scandalous Text, uh, The Unchained Bible, the joy of Kierkegaard. Um, but for those of us in Quaker studies, he's probably best known for his contributions on Robert Barclay, um, a very significant article um, early on. And then more recently, the chapter on Robert Barclay uh, in uh, Quakers and the, in early theological thought. Uh, so we're very pleased uh, to welcome Hugh. And as I say, it's a personal pleasure having known him for over I think 35 years now. So, which as I said to him, which given that we're both in our 30s is really quite surprising, but anyway. So, Hugh, um, thank you very much for being with us this evening. And um, I'm going to turn my camera off and pass over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ben. And it really is a pleasure and an honor to be asked to give this lecture. Just in case anybody's wondering, I'm giving it to you from the island of South Ronaldsey in Orkney, where I live now. So this is one of the advantages of the unfortunate situation we've all had to deal with, that we can do these things at long distance. Who would have guessed when it was cancelled last year that we'd still have to be doing this? But at least we can, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. I'm really using this opportunity uh, to indulge myself a little, having recently retired, as Ben said, from the University of Sheffield, I wanted to reflect on a few things I've learned over the years of trying to explain the importance of the Bible and its interpretation to myself and to others. So the talk you'll be hearing is at one level a very potted intellectual autobiography, if I can be that pretentious, and more importantly really, a tribute to many teachers who have helped to shape my thinking. Teachers in the flesh, but also as so many of us had, really important teachers who I have met between the pages of books. So that's the kind of thing it is. It's a reflection on uh, things I've learned over the years um, and various figures that I've interacted with who I hope I've learned from. So I do have a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm now going to try the magical operations necessary to get the PowerPoint uh, shared with you.
Now, I hope you're, I hope you're seeing what you should be seeing here. The title of the talk, as you will have seen, is Tolstoy or Kierkegaard, Dilemmas of Quaker Biblical Interpretation. That in itself is a homage to the title of a book that had a very important effect on me when I came across it. The book is by the great literary critic, sadly recently dead, George Steiner. And it's his first book. It's called Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, an essay in contrast. And that had, as I say, a really big effect on the way that I began to think about uh, interpreting and using the Bible. It's the kind of title that poses a, a neat antithesis, in this case between two of the major Russian literary figures of the 19th century. And Steiner explains that it was written as a first book should be out of a sense of compulsion. He really wanted to share with other people, and I quote, his conviction that the reader's inevitable preference of one master over the other will define a whole philosophic and political stance. So his thesis is that reading Tolstoy and Dostoevsky everyone will eventually discover that they're a Tolstoyan or a Dostoevskian. And that will say a great deal about their political and philosophical stance. Both of them are masters. He doesn't for a moment deny that. Both have their place, but they are fundamentally contrasted. He's not the first person to say that. The great Russian philosopher Berdyaev said, it would be possible to determine two patterns, two types of men's souls. The one inclined to uh, the spirit of Tolstoy, the other toward that of Dostoevsky. So he's echoing something that has been said and Berdyaev, again, is not the only one to say such things. It's a lovely antithesis. I have an antithesis of my own. You can see the second quotation, if you can see it, is from Hugh S. Piper. There are two types of people, those who think there are two types of people, and those who suspect that things may be a bit more complicated than that. And it's how that maps onto the distinction that uh, George Steiner finds between Dostoy and Dostoevsky that's really the impulse behind this paper. But you'll notice that my title wasn't Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, it's Tolstoy or Kierkegaard. How come Kierkegaard's muscling out Dostoevsky? Well, that's partly autobiographical. I spent a lot of my life wrestling with Kierkegaard, who has been a very important but sometimes very difficult teacher to me uh, for decades. But there are very real parallels between Dostoevsky's worldview and Kierkegaard's. Those have often been point, pointed out. Um, of course, um, both Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard, let alone Tolstoy, stand here proxy for a vast and complex body of literature and thought. So in a way, uh, I'm committing that inevitable academic sin of turning them into slogans or labels for a particular worldview. And um, if you're going to reduce them to labels, Tolstoy on the one hand and Dostoevsky or Kierkegaard on the other, I think is a viable move. Now, the, the second part of my title, The Dilemmas of Quaker Biblical Interpretation, takes me back 20 years 
to something I wrote as a response to a collection of papers in Quaker religious thought um, on uses of scripture by early friends. My response, you might be able just to see at the very bottom of the table of contents there, was entitled, Can There Be a Quaker Hermeneutic? I.e., can there be a distinctive Quaker approach to the interpretation of the Bible? Actually, I would have been just as happy to entitle it, Should There Be a Quaker Hermeneutic? a particular Quaker way of approaching the Bible. But naturally, if the answer to the question, the first question, can there be, is a negative, then there's not much point in asking the second question. If there can't be one, then there's no point in arguing about whether there should be one. So a second strand of this talk is me revisiting what I wrote 20 years ago and considering how the dichotomy that Steiner poses may help at least to illuminate, if not answer, the question of whether it makes sense to talk about a Quaker biblical interpretation. Now, as a matter of fact, because I'm not quite as daft as I look, this is made a little easier by the fact that Tolstoy and Kierkegaard both have links to Quakers uh, and to their use of the Bible. The two worldviews that they represent have impinged on Quaker biblical interpreters, to some extent have been influenced by Quaker biblical interpreters. And so the dilemma I'm uh, uh, proposing, the choice between Tolstoy and Kierkegaard, or is it a choice? is part of the history of Quaker thought on the Bible. Well, as you'll realize, I've now spent several minutes um, in a convoluted exercise of self-reflection on the title of this paper. Um, so perhaps I need to proceed now to get to the nub of the argument. I'm sure you're dying to know by this point, just what the contrast is between these two worldviews world um, and what Steiner was on about. Well, I'm going to be slightly annoying and delay even a little more because I need to invoke another very significant figure in my intellectual history, uh, another Russian thinker who influenced me very considerably, the literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin, probably less well known than Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, but interesting. He was a fascinating, enigmatic, in some ways tragic figure. Um, the, the book that really brought, gives him a place in this was called The Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics. Written in the 1920s, he and his whole uh, life went under a severe cloud under Soviet rule in Russia. And it wasn't until, until the 1960s that anybody rediscovered his work. And in fact, the Russian, young Russian scholars who discovered this book and began to be excited about it were really rather surprised to discover he was still alive and living in Siberia in an internal exile. Independently of uh, Steiner, actually, he too was interested in this contrast between Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Now, his body of writing is enormously complex and very controversial in some ways. But if we are going to reduce him to a slogan, he talked about the monologism of Tolstoy, monologue uh, as the characteristic, as opposed to the dialogism, the dialogue in Dostoevsky. In essence, what he was claiming is that Tolstoy's novels, for all their profusion of characters and so on, 
are characterized by the authority of a single voice, the author. The characters within the novel are the author's uh, ventriloquist puppy, puppets, if you like. They may appear to have independent existence, but in the end, they all speak in the author's voice. And the author, in this case, Tolstoy, insists on retaining absolute control of the story and its mode of telling. That's his view of, um, in a very condensed way, of what Tolstoy was about, monologism. But the genius of Dostoevsky and what makes him problematic for Bakhtin is that that's not the case in his novels. His characters have their own voices. The dialogue between them is genuine. The authorial voice disappears completely behind them. And Bakhtin uses this to suggest that there is a contrasting view of what language is about and what constructing a human identity is about between Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Now, let me try and explain a little bit more what's going on with this dichotomy. The monologic view might seem at first glance simply to be common sense. It suggests that speech, when we speak, is controlled by the speaker. We think a thought, we translate it into words, into speech. It arrives at our hearers as speech, and then they translate it back into thought. Of course, that's a pretty fraught business. Things go wrong. We don't say what we mean, people misinterpret what we hear. So in a funny way, in this view of how communication works, language is really a problem. If we could in some way go um, find ourselves in the company of Mr. Spock, for instance, in Star Trek, and simply transfer thoughts between each other, life would be much better and everything would work much more smoothly. Speech here is necessary, but it's a kind of necessary and frustrating evil. That's monologism. We might think, um, as I say, it's often what people think, well, that's obviously how it works, but maybe it doesn't. And that's the point that Bakhtin wants to draw having looked at Dostoevsky and the way his characters are constructed. Bakhtin's dialogic view is to suggest that language is controlled by the hearer. And that seems rather strange, um, a little counterintuitive. But he points out that when we speak, we are choosing our words, not, not as if we are speaking into a vacuum, we're choosing our words in anticipation of what our hearers are interested in, what they'll understand, what they'll respond to, what will have an emotional effect on them, if we are any good at communicating at all. And we don't find um, a, a sort of wordless thought and then encapsulate it in language, there's no such thing, Bakhtin would say, as thought without language. And language is already somebody else's. We don't invent it, we inherit it. It carries associations that we never put with it, and some of which we may not be aware of. So the Bakhtinian view and the Dostoevskian view would be that meaning doesn't exist in some mental space stripped of language, but meaning occurs through the process of dialogue. It's only when we speak and then hear our own voices and the responses of others to us that we actually engage in the process of, of 
creating meaning. So in a sense, language gives rise to thought, not the other way around. Now that's an extremely simplistic uh, and reductive account of a very important and controversial discussion. But the point of bringing it up is to say that Steiner's view, Bergeyev's view, is that um, underneath this is uh, a, a dichotomy that has a profound effect on the way people understand their place in the world. It affects, and this is where it impinges on this talk, how you would go about understanding what's going on in a text like the Bible. Is the Bible monologic or dialogic? Is our reading of it informed by monologic or dialogic understandings of how texts and communities interact? Which, if any, characterizes a Quaker approach? And that's the dilemma the title of this lecture points to. Well, to begin to look at this, we can perhaps try and see what the place of the Bible was in the works of our protagonists, Tolstoy, Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky. Let's start with Tolstoy. As you may know, he became increasingly uh, interested in religion as he grew older. He embraced a life of simplicity and of pacifism, which he saw as conforming to the will of God as reflected in Jesus' teachings. And at that time, it's not surprising, he came to the attention of Quakers through his writings. And he himself was quite amused, but also impressed by the earnest attempts of Quakers to press on him Fox's journal and Barclay's apology, which they thought would be very good for him to read. And he did indeed uh, agree that he found there many of his own biblical arguments for Christian pacifism, but couched uh, centuries before his own thought. Now his attitude to the Bible and to Christianity was complex, but it displays all the hallmarks of a kind of monologic understanding of what was going on. Even as a young officer in the Crimean War, he wrote as follows. Oops, I'm having trouble moving on with my PowerPoint. Anyway. A conversation about divinity and faith has suggested to me a great, a stupendous idea to the realization of which I feel capable of devoting my life. That idea is the founding of a new religion, corresponding to the present state of mankind, the religion of Christ, but purged of dogmas and absolutism, a practical religion, not promising future bliss, but giving bliss on earth, deliberately to promote the union of mankind by religion is the basic thought which I hope will dominate me. So there we see a view, a uh, very clear view uh, of Tolstoy of how he's going to approach the Bible. What he did my, rather later in life, was precisely to rewrite the Bible, or more specific, the Gospels, to accord with his own views. In 1892, he produced what he called a translation harmony and a analysis of the four Gospels, where he tried to iron out and bring together into one coherent story the Gospel narrative, 
And in, 18, in 1902, he published a work called A Gospel in Brief, the gospel according to Tolstoy, really. And in this work, he removed all the supernatural aspects of the gospels, any reference to Jesus's divinity, any reference to miracles. All of that, he thought, was entirely superfluous because the purpose was to have a practical religion. Let's see if I can reshare this screen. I think something is frozen here. Oh, yes, there's the quote. And here is Tolstoy's gospel in brief. What Tolstoy is doing, really, is that he wants to be, the, in a sense, immediately in touch with the thought of God, with the will of God, which um, means, in a sense, that the Bible, Jesus, language, in a strange sense, are actually getting in the way. It's intriguing actually that the early church didn't choose just one account of Jesus's life but out of the many accounts that were available in the first centuries chose to remain with four and ever since even at the earliest times there have been those who have been annoyed by this who think there must be just one story and want to produce a harmonized gospel encompassing all four. Most famous of these is a book called The Diatessaron by Tatian written in the second century. There must be one story behind all of this. Only one thing can be true. And so in some ways, though the Bible is the only evidence we have of this, it's a really irritating thing. We want to reduce it. We want to get down to the essence of it. That's a kind of monologic view of what we'd be doing. And how are we going to do this? Well, for Tolstoy and for many other people, well, we, you have to make judgments on what's reasonable and what's believable. Uh, and if, when you do that, you will find what's the essence. For Tolstoy, it was just unfortunate that God's intentions have to be deduced from a set of apparently contradictory texts, which have overlaid Jesus' teaching with superstitions and factious arguments. But even if we could go back and speak to Jesus for Tolstoy, we'd be in trouble he was constrained by the language he spoke, and certainly for Tolstoy, who denies any divine aspect of Jesus' being, uh, Jesus might not quite have understood what he was saying himself. He was simply a witness to a truth that was bigger than him, which should also be conveyed by many other philosophers and prophets uh, through human history. Jesus is one culturally bound and limited exemplar of this. In fact, he went so far as to say, it's terrible to say, but it sometimes appears to me that if Christ's teaching with the church teaching that has grown out of it had not existed at all, those who now call themselves Christians would have been nearer in truth to the truth of Christ. That's to say, and here's a rather important uh, definition, the truth of Christ, he goes on, that's to say a reasonable understanding of what is good in life than they are now. So for Tolstoy, the gospel in the end comes down to a reasonable understanding of what is good of life, and in fact, a reasonable man, as he certainly thought himself to be, 
could really deduce all that himself without needing any church or any Bible or any messianic prophet to tell him. Elsewhere, Tolstoy says, the voice of Christ is to be identified with the whole rational consciousness of humanity. And the essence of what Christ came to do was, quote, to teach human beings not to commit stupidities. Now, for Steiner and for other readers, that speaks to Tolstoy's own view of his um, authority as uh, the one who can set the limits as to what is reasonable and what is stupid. So for Tolstoy, the monologic approach that he has means that interpreting the Bible comes down to effectively erasing it. You can do without the Bible. All one could learn from it is available in the rational consciousness of humanity. And the only reason for spending any time on it when it comes right down to it is that the power and influence of the Orthodox Church in Russia in his day, which is claiming the right to provide authoritative teaching, is what he is really countering. Um, he wouldn't be talking of the Bible if they weren't. And that approach to the Bible, though maybe not in quite the extreme way that Tolstoy meant it, was very influential in men and appealed to many Quakers, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century, where Tolstoy was regarded as a great prophet of uh, a new uh, kind of society, and particularly in the run-up to and the consequences of the 1914 war. Um, Quakers themselves come out of another point where uh, a deeply biblical society is trying to rethink itself and to redefine what we mean by authority. Um, Quaker uh, writers in the early years of Quakerism are engaged in their own way in the great intellectual quest of their time, which was to find truth, which was defined in terms of certainty. The leading thinkers when early Quakers were at work, people like Descartes and Spinoza, in their different ways, are expounding an understanding of truth as something that's uh, demonstrable universally, that will be valid in all circumstances. And the supreme example that they always aspire to is the axiomatic system of Euclidic geometry. Something's true if it's as certain as the fact that the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. When we turn to a remarkable figure like Samuel Fisher, the early uh, Quaker writer on the Bible, copious writer, he states as his first principle, the foundation of the faith must be something that is infallible, firm, fixed, certain, stable, sure, and inalterable. He was never one to use one word where six would do. And of course, in the context of the 17th century, the ground of that certainty for most Protestants was the Bible. That didn't suit Fisher. His great opponent, and Fisher's work is uh, actually a huge polemic 
against this man and his uh, followers. His great opponent was the Archbishop of Canterbury and academic John Owen. Now he found certainty in the Bible, but he thought he could guarantee that certainty by asserting that every single dot and comma of the Hebrew version of the scriptures was directly divinely inspired. Everything. On the basis that if any of it could be questioned, then everything was up for question. Fisher devoted pages to an obsessive refutation of this claim. He seeks to show that no text can be fixed and inalterable just because it's a text. It's had a history. It's been misread. It's been miscopied. Any language can be misinterpreted or misunderstood, especially across the gap of time that divides us from the biblical writers. So, if it's not the Bible, though, the fount of certainty has to be somewhere else. For Fisher, it's in the direct mediation of the spirit, thought to thought, without the inevitable, failing, uh, feeble exigencies of language and all that's concerned in human communication. So this direct thought to thought transference in a sense between the spirit and the human being is possible. And the Bible, again, for all its usefulness, is in a sense a distraction. Oops, this is sticking again. Oh, there's a book that, uh, of course, makes much of this case uh, about the importance of the Bible in these debates. And here's Fisher's own um, testimony of truth exalted, uh, huge and extraordinary book. Um, this one looks well thumbed, but um, I'm not quite sure who's ever really read it. But in that book, Fisher says, as written in the spirit, the Holy Scriptures may be said to be homogeneous writings, all of one kind, i.e. they're all the, the product of the spirit. But in respect of the several businesses written off herein, they are as heterogeneous a body or bulk of as various writings as any extant in the world beside them. So here's Fisher saying, well, actually, this is a whole heap of very peculiar things that have got put together. For him, that's not a virtue. That's something that mitigates them against being the source of truth, because truth ought to be all the same. Uh, and it's only if you start making this move about being spiritually inspired that you can do that with the Bible. But what he does, and he does it along with a, a number of other figures that are working at the t this time, other philosophers, um, Protestant and Catholic, who are not happy with this appeal to the Bible as the sole source of authority, but in order to make their a plea for their own source of authority, whether that would be the Pope or the king, or the inner light, they are quite happy to find ways of showing the diversity and the fallibility of scripture. And it's in this way that such figures become those who initiate what now is the critical study of the Bible where these writings are looked at as if they were any other writing extant in the world, and their variety and their heterogeneity is stressed.
Now, for me, um, and this is where my intellectual autobiography is coming in, that kind of approach has very severe limitations as a way of interpreting the Bible. It's rather like seeking to discover somebody else's inmost thoughts by dissecting their brain. However diligently you search through, you're not going to find a little kernel of thought. That's not how thought works. It's not located in that way. It's a product of the brain working in a complex association with one human body, which in turn is embedded in an environment of human culture and of the natural world. It fails to acknowledge that you can't, you just can't extract truth in some way from its means of expression and from the conditions where it's communicated. There's no such thing as this naked truth. It sees here, and Fisher is a witness to this, the very textuality, the very fact that it's a text as a problem for the Bible, as a distraction from its meaning, rather than doing what I would say was the real task, taking that seriously as the condition for the Bible being meaningful or important at all. So, what about the dialogic approach? Would that get us any further? Well, Dostoevsky could not be more different. For Steiner says, for Dostoevsky, the image of Christ is the center of gravity. And this is Steiner summarizing his view of Dostoevsky in the quote that I hope you can see. Whereas Tolstoy cited with approval Coleridge's warning against those who love Christianity better than truth, Dostoevsky asserted in his own name and through the mouths of his characters that in the event of contradiction, Christ was infinitely more pressure to, to him than either truth or reason. His imagination dwelt on the figure of the Son of God with such passionate scrutiny that it's possible to read a major portion of Dostoevskyan fiction as a gloss on the New Testament. Now, that might seem a rather peculiar and alarming claim. Christ infinitely more precious than either truth or reason. Surely that's just a recipe for blind fanaticism. But we need to consider a little more what's at stake here. A lot depends on what your definition of truth is. The kind of truth that's being set against Christianity here, which has its roots in the view we've just been looking at, truth as certainty, is in Dostoevsky's view, a complete illusion, as I've been trying to say. You can't get that kind of certainty. And so therefore, to love that sort of illusion of truth better than Christianity would be really rather daft. We never have sufficient information to reach that kind of certainty. And even if we did, Human reason, Dostoevsky is very sure, has its limits. It can't be the arbiter of everything. It's, it's a very frail and um, easily misled instrument. And for Dostoevsky, and here's where he's very similar to Kierkegaard, that's what faith consists in. It's to believe, to make a choice to believe in the face not just of insufficient evidence, 
but in the understanding that there will never and can never be sufficient evidence to justify your belief. You just have to make the choice. Famously, Kierkegaard expressed this as taking a leap of faith. Dostoevsky doesn't use that phrase, but that's what happens to his characters in their books. They come to a point where they have to make a choice, but they cannot make any rational deduction of what that choice should be or what its consequences are. But choice has to be made. And for both of them, but also particularly for Kierkegaard, paradox is the, the heart of this. He looks for paradox, not for certainty or clarity. It's not that he doesn't have a place for reason. In fact, very few people were capable of using reason more effectively. It's exactly because he feels he's used his reason to the end of its abilities that you can truly get to the point of thinking that something is a paradox. It's only by the use of reason you can distinguish that from what would be just a mistake or a muddle or a confusion. There's a difference and reason can clarify that. For Kierkegaard and for Dostoevsky, the ultimate paradox is the claim that Jesus is both God and human. It's this entirely unreasonable and un fathomable claim, one which it would be very hard to think how you could have the evidence finally to be absolutely sure that is important because it's not just a claim, but it's a very provocative claim. Kierkegaard calls it a scandal using a New Testament expression, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be. And he was always much more in favor of the people who are actually scandalized by this ridiculous claim by the, than by the people who just take it on the nod. They were far more to his taste uh, than the people who never were worried about this glaring paradox at the heart of the New Testament. So looked at in this way, this strange choice that we seem to be faced with between Christ and the truth is not one between certainties on which all rational people would agree and the fantasies of some dogmatic tradition, but between the illusion of certainty, labelled as truth, and the incomprehensible, the irresistible challenge of an absolute paradox. Now, you may not, that may not reconcile you any more to Dostoevsky's view than originally, but it's not quite as uh, sheerly perverse and fanatical and irrational as it seems. So what does that mean for biblical interpretation? We're supposed to be talking about that. Well, that would mean that there's a form of biblical interpretation that isn't interested in smoothing over the contradictions and tensions in the textual tradition, but actually seeks them out, wants to play with them because they can be the source of surprising counterintuitive inspiration. The fact that there are four gospels rather than one is not an inconvenience, it's actually an opportunity and part of the communication. Instead of reducing the multiple voices of the text and characters to one voice, it revels in dialogue. Rather than imposing a set of propositions or trying to extract them from the text, it tries to enter into conversation with these voices and hopes to find its own voice by listening and responding to these other voices, borrowing their words to discover what its own meaning may be. 
Now that kind of approach, of course, could be a recipe for irresponsibility and for what disparagingly is called eisegesis, where meaning is put into the text just because you want to find it there. But for Dostoevsky, that's the danger of freedom. If you're going to be free, you're going to be free to be wrong and irresponsible. There, oh, I forgot to put this up. There's a picture of Kierkegaard, just so that he didn't feel left out. Kierkegaard uh, contemplating these issues. Steiner tells us, in what are among his final notes, Dostoevsky observed, the savior did not descend from the cross because he did not wish to convert men through the compulsion of outward miracle, but through freedom of the belief. I think Dostoevsky here is thinking very much of perhaps Paul's view of the crucified Jesus as the absolute paradox. And it wasn't something that Tolstoy had very much time for. Um, what on earth, why on earth go through all that in the sake of truth? In fact, uh, as Steiner goes on to say, in that refusal, in that supreme liberality where Jesus, instead of saying, well, yes, I really am God, here I am coming down from the cross, left it up to people to believe or not. Tolstoy saw the chaos and blindness of the, uh, affecting the human mind. Sorry, I've doubled that somehow. Christ's policy appeared to Tolstoy, says Steiner, like that of a monarch who would go about in rags and obscurity, allowing his realm to fall into disorder so as to sanctify those few among his subjects acute enough to recognize him even in disguise. Uh, this whole way of going about things just annoyed Tolstoy. Kierkegaard, for, oh, sorry, Kierkegaard, particularly in his book, Training in Christianity, though, seizes on the image of Jesus as the disguised king as uh, really important to his own thought. Kierkegaard thought that the kind of direct communication between God and human beings that perhaps is behind Fisher's view of how the spirit can speak directly to the spirit um, that just was not possible. God and human beings are absolutely other to each other, he thought. And if God was to speak to us directly, we couldn't comprehend what he was saying, and we probably wouldn't survive the encounter. For Kierkegaard, God has to disguise himself out of love for his human interlocutors to avoid just overwhelming them, bullying in a sense, you know, uh, making it totally unavoidable for them to believe. Then that's reduced entirely their human freedom to nothing in his view. God knows, so Kierkegaard would say, that what's communicated depends quite as much on the nature and relationship of those who are in dialogue as it does on the actual words spoken. It's not really even that God has to adopt a disguise. Our human comprehension is so limited that what we know of God or think we know of God is such a partial view that it might as well be a disguise. Now, Kierkegaard can be very annoying as a teacher, as I said, but he was quite aware of it. He once said that where other people had striven to make the New Testament easier to understand, he thought his job was to make it more difficult. And he wasn't simply being perverse, though he was quite capable of that. What he means is that too often, when we think we've read or interpreted the Bible, 
All we mean is that we found a way of accommodating it to what it suits our view of what is acceptable, reasonable, comprehensible. He wants to say, well, no, reasonable is not the word. It's not the issue. I want to provoke you to the point where you have to make a decision. Is this completely crazy or isn't it? And I have no way really of assessing it. Rather than smoothing the path for his readers, he wants to confront them with the problems of the text. And only then is there a hope that they'll learn the strategies to live with them or the humility to realize that they can't. And so in a strange way, that means that paradoxically, if we're really to try and read the Bible, we've got to recognize the extent to which it's unreadable. Making sense of the Bible is only possible if we're really honest about the extent to which we make sense, we construct meaning, rather than imagining that we're extracting some kind of lucid, lucid meaning that's lurking behind the overgrowth of language. There's a nice description of Kierkegaard's writing that I'd like to share with you. Kierkegaard conceived it his function as a writer to strip men of their disguises, to compel them to see evasions for what they are, to label blind alleys, to cut off men's retreats, to tear down the niggardly roofs they continue to build over their precious sundials, to isolate men from themselves, to enforce self-examination, and to bring them solitarily and alone before the eternal. Here, he left them. Now, interestingly enough, that's a passage written by an eminent Quaker, Douglas V. Steer, who was very instrumental in American Friends Service Committee, uh, amongst much else that he did in his life as a philosopher. Um, he took himself to Denmark precisely to learn Danish in order to be able to translate Kierkegaard. Um, his translation of Kierkegaard's purity of heart is to will one thing is among the first translation of Kierkegaard's works in English at the beginning of the 20th century. And it's really fascinating that a number of Quaker intellectuals at that point were very early in taking up the challenges that Kierkegaard offered. And Kierkegaard, perhaps, I'm aligning with Dostoevsky with this dialogic approach as opposed to the monologic. The radical stripping away of illusions, the idea of the individual alone and accountable before God is a strand that has deep roots in Quaker tradition too, and indeed beyond it into medieval piety. Of course, it has its dangers. It can fossilize into what is sometimes rather lazily stigmatized as quietism, a kind of conviction, not that uh, the world will be changed by human action, but precisely that all human action is displeasing to God and that all is required of us is a complete surrender of the will, which in a way would be a surrender of the very freedom that seems to be so important. But can we decide not to decide, if you see what I mean, in that quietest way? Can we willingly renounce the use of our reason and our will. Taken to the extreme, this Kierkegaardian approach in its own way leads us to disregard the textuality of scripture. It simply becomes the occasion for this very individual lonely encounter with the divine. And in that moment, the content of scripture 
can kind of cease to matter. But that seems to me, again, not to take seriously what we are confronted with in the Bible. Now, perhaps somewhat controversially, I sometimes have teased students who come from a more conservative uh, biblical centered tradition when the, to study the Bible, that it seems to me at times they try to read the Bible as if it was the Quran. What I mean by that is that if you're wanting a book that gives you unequivocally divine instructions on how to conduct your life and understand your place in human society in the first person statements of God, Allah, then the Quran fills that bill much better than the Bible. That's what it is. It consists almost entirely of first person speech by Allah addressed to the prophet in a limited period of time and in a limited place that sets up the foundation for individual and social uh, mores. But that's not what the Bible does or is. I, it struck me, and it's one of these things that we've learned to take for granted, I think, but it's actually quite remarkable that the very first word of the book of Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, is in the beginning. We take it for granted, but no other body of sacred scripture known to me begins with the beginning. The very fact that we might think that's natural just shows how imbued we are with biblical ideas. But what it's doing is it's showing us from the start that we're about to embark on a journey, a journey through time. And the very next word in Genesis, in the beginning, God, tells us that this is not a book where the divinity addresses us directly, but there is a narrator who is telling us about God. God is a character in the story, whatever else he is. And what we learn of him will be what we learn of characters in stories. Centrality of story to the Bible is really important. And both these approaches can miss that a bit. We will learn, if we do, from the Bible as we watch characters interact with each other and with God. We have to read between the lines we're like the eavesdroppers on the scenes played out before us. We have to infer things about the motivations and desires of the characters from their actions. We, can, we have to take it seriously that their speech may hide as well as reveal what they are up to. And Bakhtin particularly, and in their way Dostoevsky and Kierkegaard, have taught me that every utterance is necessarily ambiguous. The admirable attempts of early Quakers to live up to an ideal predicated on a monologic view that there can be complete transparency between what we think, what we say, and what we do, something they find, for instance, in the book of James in the Bible, is actually based on an flawed understanding of how language and communication can possibly work. So where am I left? Well, I want to introduce you to one last teacher of mine, perhaps less well known than some of the others, Edouard Glissant. He's less well known in uh, English speaking world, but in the Francophone world, He's a revered novelist, playwright, poet, and theorist of post-colonialism. He was twice a finalist for the Nobel Prize in Literature. 
He was born in the French uh, territory of Martinique in 1928 and spent many years teaching in the City University of New York before he died in 2011. I want to think, claim that he has helped me to shed light on obscure aspects of the biblical text. But I have immediately to retract that statement because I've just fallen into the kind of intellectual and cultural European assumptions that Gleeson always wanted to question. The problem is that I used the metaphor shed light. The assumption in Western intellectual circles has tended to be that our business with the biblical texts or with anything that we're trying to do intellectually is to bring light, to shine light on what was in darkness and to make transparent things that are unclear and muddled. We want to clarify things and thus to understand them and comprehend them. Now, might seem absolutely unquestionable, but Glisson questions it. He says, this is very much a Western attitude. It's not, for, um, it's not by accident that the great intellectual movement in the West is called the Enlightenment. There's a whole cluster of metaphors around valuing light. We like lucidity, clear-sightedness, transparency. And actually that's particularly true in the French intellectual culture, he would say. What he says is that when Europe encountered Africa or France encounters Martinique and tries to deal with the mysterious and different people there, what they want to do, and it sounds very benign, is to render things transparent and understandable. But he says this is actually uh, in bad faith. What really is going on is that we evade otherness by trying to describe it in terms that makes it seem fundamentally the same. And that's to defend ourselves from the disruptive possibilities of the truly different. Glisson championed not light and enlightenment, but what he called opacity. And he said, I claim for everyone the right to opacity. He says everybody has the right to that part of themselves that isn't understandable or obvious or transparent to everyone else. In fact, that's one of the things that makes us human. It's one of the things that distinguishes one culture from another, that it will have an opacity. And that's a valuable thing. It's not something to regret. There's a primal right not to be understood, not to be assimilated into somebody else's explanation of you. And he says, um, Western culture doesn't just explain, try to explain other cultures to itself, but explains them to themselves. Glissant wanted to find a way to celebrate the diversity and the relations that could only come about because there was difference. Everything's the same. There's no re need for dialogue, relation. There's nothing to learn from somebody who is exactly the same as you. It's respect for each other's opacity that's important. Now, I think that uh, insight was important for me to take back into biblical interpretation. He is not, Glissant himself, particularly uh, interested in uh, the Bible, doesn't write that much about it, but 
what I would want to take from him is that the diversity of the Bible, instead of being uh, an obstacle to clarity, actually is part of the point. There's a whole slew of opacities in the Bible, and it's in negotiating with that opacity that we might learn something. And reading Glisson led me, I think, to read the story of the Tower of Babel a bit differently, and perhaps um, with a new insight. And I want to bring this to an end, really, by going into a particular biblical story just for a little bit to see how the Bible itself may be dealing with these issues and how we can best read it. What Gleason points out is, well, you know the story of, of Babel, where the peoples gather together, decide to build themselves a great tower. Uh, God, in the traditional view of the story, becomes concerned about the fact that they may be trying to uh, invade heaven. And so he disrupts the language because everyone was speaking the same language and scatters the people across the earth as a punishment for their presumptuousness. But if you actually look at the story, that's not the only way to interpret what's going on. For a start, the people specifically say that their object in building their tower is to prevent themselves from being scattered over the world. It's not that they're claiming heaven. They don't want to be scattered. They want to keep together. They want to lock themselves into this tower. But the building of such a tower actually flies in the face of the divine command in Genesis chapter 2 that human beings are to fill the earth as part of God's great creation. They're not doing that. They've locked themselves in a tower. The desire they have for unity and safety is also a refusal of the invitation to explore, to travel, to risk change through exposure to new and diverse environments. Just as in some senses, the story of humanity needs the expulsion from the garden, otherwise it would just be the story of life in the garden. So this scattering from Babel is necessary for the story to go on. And indeed, as often happens, when you really go back to look at the Hebrew, um, which I'm not going to expatiate on in any great length, we discover that the conventional understanding of the story depends on our conventional translation. The conventional translation is that God confuses or confounds the language of the people which sounds very negative. He breaks language and they can no longer understand each other. But the usual use of the same word in Hebrew is to mean mixing. And it means mixing in the context of mixing ingredients for baking bread or a cake. That's not a negative thing. And that's how you transform raw ingredients into something new and different and tasty. Now, this takes on a particular significance in, Gliol's, in Gleason's case, because he was always a great champion of Creole, the distinctive language of the black population of Martinique, which the French education uh, department always sought to keep out of the schools in Martinique because they saw it simply as a corruption, a corrupted version of French. 
It's the enemy of clarity of expression simply showed the lack of education of the black population that they couldn't even speak French properly. Glissant's view was very different. He sees the Creole as a great triumph of that population, deprived of their own languages. After all, they, the black population of Martinique had been brought uh, entirely against their will, from a whole range of linguistic groups. So when they arrived in uh, the island, there may be nobody else amongst the slave population who spoke their own language. Deprived of that language, having no common be tongue between them except the French of their masters, the enslaved Africans developed this mixed language that allowed them to communicate among themselves perfectly adequately, but was obscure or opaque to the dominant French authorities. For Glisson, that embodied the slave's inventiveness and their successful creation of something that helped them to maintain their dignity and their identity. So is the same true in the Babel story? Is this a positive story of God mixing up language in order to shatter this dull uniformity and to provide these individual groups with their own capacity to maintain opacity? That's the way they could develop and sustain the diversity of identities which prerequisite for true relation. So only when people were separated and had different experiences that they actually could have dialogue when they came back together and met each other. So this isn't a punishment, it's actually saving people from themselves, from a sterile sameness and a lack of story. But of course, there are risks this whole process opens up the possibility of misunderstanding, conflict, and the whole sorry story of battles and betrayals, of xenophobia and genocide that unfolds in the pages of the Bible, and in which we're still caught up, um, is a consequence. But it's another way of reading the story. Tolstoy's aim, of course, was to reconcile humanity, stress its unity. He would have quite liked one language, everybody speaking the same, understanding each other in the Tower of Babel. But Dostoevsky perhaps was as prophetic as Tolstoy when he said any human scheme, looking at the Russia of time, of his time, that was tried to bring about a, a kingdom of God on earth would inevitably degenerate into tyranny because human beings are just not capable of that. So, as I conclude, I don't think I've solved any dilemmas of biblical interpretation, but not, dilemmas aren't about solutions. It's the effort that's endlessly frustrating and endlessly rewarding. I don't know that I've uh, answered what a Quaker biblical interpretation might be, except to suggest that any approach to the Bible that seeks validation for its own assumptions will find that it gets questions, not answers, from approaching the text. So let me just finish on one final image. And part of my very important part of my biography. I always like to see the Bible sitting on the table in the midst of a friend's meeting as friends and attenders gather. They come in carrying with them their own stories Stories built out of the encounters over their lives, long or short. Stories, perhaps, that they don't even quite understand themselves. Stories not known, 
to the other members of the meeting. They settled down into the silence, carrying their memories, their traumas, their prejudices, their blind spots, their imagination, their insight, their capacity to listen. They join the text on the table, which is the record of a long and continuing conversation of voices, some rejoicing, some mourning, some vindictive, some forgiving, some judgmental, others resigned, some seductive, some intimidating and repellent. Like it or not, though, these biblical voices are present in the meeting, whether the book is there or not, because they've shaped the culture and language through which each individual there has had to contend and use to make meaning of their own life. Yes, some of these voices are very dark, but the Quaker advices and queries enjoin us to trust the leadings of God whose light shows us our darkness and brings us to new life. The corollary of that, surely, is that it can be as we become aware of our darkness that we become aware of the possibility of light. But there the book lies, in silence, waiting along with the gathering meeting. Not for silence as an end in itself, not as a prelude for some prepared and dogmatic teaching, but waiting to have words listened out of it. What I've given you, I hope, are some of the words that I'm grateful that the Bible and friends have listened out of me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're we're coming up to the the advertised end time, but oh, I, well. it's okay. Don't worry. Uh, so I understand if um, people do need to leave, but um, I hope otherwise we might carry on a little bit with uh, um, comments and questions. Just to remind you, we are recording this and it will later be available on the Woodbrook website. And the process um, to ask a question is to, to raise your hand. Um, I will then call you and you will then get a prompt from Becky, our host this evening, uh, which will allow you to, to unmute. So I see Phil, is, is your hand raised to, uh, for a question? Yep. Okay. So, Phil, if uh, Becky, we can send Phil an invite. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Hugh. Nice to see you after all these years. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> Are you hearing me or has it gone? Yes, I'm hearing you. Oh. Okay. Not okay. hearing you. I know Phil has been having some problems with his sound throughout. I can hear you, but I don't know whether you can hear me. Yeah. Yes, you can. can. Rose. Well, nice, nice to see you after all these years, Hugh. Thank you very much for that. Um, I found that very interesting. And I, I also took great joy from the subtitle version, uh, which was a little mm -hmm. different and often quite hilarious. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, anyway. We have to do our best with technology. Um, I, I scribbled down notes uh, earlier in, in the earlier part of your talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I remembered, with things that you said, I remembered that when I was a kid, uh, by that I mean about maybe the age of 10, 12, 13, I'm not quite sure, I had a little book that was called The Harmony of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the bee's knees. Now, I don't know which version it was, but uh, and I've lost it since. Um, but I really thought that that was what we ought to be aiming at. Mm. Now, 
later, uh, as you know, I, I went on to be a history student mm. uh, in Manchester. And then I, I discovered that, that history is not about unanimity. Mm. History is all about and contrast and discovery. Uh, and that if you didn't have that, history was dead. Uh, and, and it's very much in that kind of way that I, that I see things, that um, we want debate, we want the next revelation and realization. Uh, that's that's uh, absolutely essential. Um, for me, on the spiritual side, it's more to do with poetry. Uh, those sudden flashes of vision and realization, uh, which are, as you said, or, or or can be overwhelming, and I think they should be overwhelming. What, what my question is, is it possible to hold a Quaker community when that is the, the major um, spiritual thrust in our community? So I'm not quite sure I got the question bit. There was a little glitch just at the... Okay. At a crucial moment, if, this if, is the last sentence again. Yeah. If if we have this 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 view that in fact the spiritual life is mainly to do with uh, poetry, uh, a sort of flashes of inspiration and vision, uh, is it then possible to the community? Oh dear. So Hugh, I think uh, Phil is asking if it's possible to sustain a community um, on the basis of paradox and complexity and opacity. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure I have some neat answer to that really, except that um, it had better be if you see what I mean. I'm not, uh, given what you're saying, um, that, that, becomes, that becomes the, ch the challenge, really. Um, and uh, another way of looking at the dichotomy I was talking about is that, yeah, yeah, Tolstoy would be very aware of that. And he saw one way by sort of, well, you know, we can get the basic, human, rational, everybody would agree, common sense things that we need to do, and we can live in community like that. Um, he didn't have a great success with that because um, it, not only was he quite a difficult person, most of the people that he would have been trying to build community with were equally um, fairly strong-willed and um, had their own view of what was universally uh, agreed, which is the paradox. So, um, I mean, I think, I think my answer to you is probably the, uh, the irritating one, that um, the, this is the situation that we're in. I love the poem by U.A. Fanthorpe when she talks about the Gospels. And Jesus talking about, well, it's all very well for everybody else, but all I've got is this collection, the ragtag collection of people. I've just inscribed my message on their yokel faces, uh, U.A. Fanthorpe, the poet says. Um, and I think that's right. It's, 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 it's not an easy thing. Um, and, but it'll come out of trust and listening more than it will come out of trying to uh, set rigid boundaries and demanding a kind of uniformity of response as the mark of community. But I'm not sure I can say anything more than that. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you, Phil. Are there other, well, other questions or comments? Yes, I can see uh, Terence, Melvin. So, Becky, if you could send Mel, uh, Terence Harris. Uh. There we go. Um, 
uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the, um, the quest for the historical Jesus and mm -hmm. whether that um, was ultimately a quest for an ahistorical Jesus in the uh, Tolstoyan mode almost. Um, mm -hmm. And then on to Schweitzer, who showed us the, the opacity of the Jesus of history, um, who, who returned to his own time and was mm -hmm. not part of ours. And then on to the new quest of, mm. of Borg and Cross, and where they seem to be assimilating Jesus into the cultural norm, in, into our own contemporary cultural norms and values. And what do you make of the whole quest for the historical Jesus? Do you see it has any value at all? Um, or do you see it as, as ultimately moving us away from the opacity of, of, of Jesus? Yeah, well, I'm afraid I'm, <laughs> I'm too good a uh, pupil of Kierkegaard to be very, in, well, I, there's an intellectual and interesting set of questions to be asked about what can be said historically, and one needs to be historically responsible when one's addressing the texts, otherwise you do just assimilate them to your own, you, you've got to know about the distance that's that's there. I was just reading, uh, I thought I might talk about him a bit more, Henry Cadbury, the great uh, Quaker New Testament scholar. All his constant reminder to people was, we are not like them and they're not like us, really. We can't assume that. We've got to be so careful not to. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we won't then find that there are similarities. We can't start from that. Um, assumption that people thought as we do uh, or would react as we do. So um, I think that, yeah, there's a, there's a valid question about you know, was there a Jesus and what sort of, what was the world of first century Palestine like and how does that bear on how we understand what he's about? But um, I, I, Kierkegaard always said, well, you, you know, it, it's the thing about it's not just let's wait until we get sufficient evidence and then we'll know what to do. Kierkegaard was always saying to people, well, if you're waiting for that, you'll wait forever. You know, there'll always be another question you haven't answered. What are you going to do today? You know, how are you going to respond to what has been presented to you as a challenge? Now, of course, you're perfectly at liberty to say, well, it's a daft challenge and I don't want anything to do with it. That's, that's freedom. But um, but if you say, well, I might believe tomorrow if you just explain to me this historical anomaly, then Kierkegaard would metaphorically uh, give you a very short shrift um, because that's that's not the issue. It's not the issue in terms of your response to it. It's, there's an intellectual issue and he's perfectly happy that that should be there, but don't confuse that and don't make it an excuse for not responding to, well, you know, as the advisors would say, the promptings and leadings of God. Well, how do I know it's a prompting of leading of God? Well, if you really, really need a forensic certain answer that makes it absolute definite, you're onto a loser, not just because you haven't got enough evidence, you will never have enough evidence. Thank you. So just to remind you, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function, which you'll find in reactions or at the bottom of the participants list. Yes, I see Stephen Angel. Oh, Stephen. Well, hello, Hugh. Hi, um, Hi Stephen. Uh, I see. Uh, <laughs> I would. Uh, I'm. I'm just wondering whether you. I, I. I'm. I'm thinking you've kind of left Tolstoy behind. Right. You know, you've, you've. You've. You've put him in the first part of your lecture, and then he's. Mm. He's been. The, the, you've treated him in a supersessionist manner. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I'm. I'm just wondering uh, whether you'd like to to do some revisionism there. Um, <laughs> certainly, uh, his his wife. Mm -hmm. uh thought uh thought that uh, his position was more opacity than enlightenment 
Um, so do things balance balance out in the end, and we really have opacity of Tolstoy and enlightenment of Kierkegaard, or you know, I mean, in, in light of the complications well, you're talking about it, at, you know, the very opening of your. Well, I see direction. what you mean. I mean, if if by as you say sort of relegating Tolstoy and going down in some sense the other way though I wouldn't necessarily go the whole way with Dostoevsky or Kierkegaard either it's maybe not as simple as that I mean obvious then the key to Tolstoy must be his own opacity mm -hmm. that, that would be a corollary of that really uh, and sure um, he was an enormously complex person and he was far less transparent to himself let alone anybody else than than he would perhaps rhetorically have wanted to claim um, and that's part of the, that's part of the issue really um, because uh, his rhetoric and how it actually panned out in the world and in and in his own life is a very complex story um, yes, it wasn't easy being Mrs. Mrs. Tolstoy. It wasn't that easy being Mrs. Dostoevsky either. To be right. And nobody ever really tried to be Mrs. Well, the one yeah, yeah, famous story there, yeah. Had, that was some story. So <laughs> that may say something about it, um, the opacities. But I think, yes, I mean, there would be a way of doing at least well, there would be an endless round of looking for the opacity in Tolstoy and, and the, clarifi the clarification in Dostoevsky. So, the, both so of then is, both is, of them, is, in a sense, can, would have to confront Gleason, I think. Uh, uh, then is there an opacity in Samuel Fisher too, or, or, or not? Is he just too taken up by the Cartesian method? Well, he's... Well, that's that's a sort of dual question in a way. I mean, he would want to do away with the opacity. Mm -hmm. uh, the the fact is, it is there. That's true. But the, I think the question is really whether you see that as a as a problem or mm -hmm. as actually an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know. Do you need to shed light into all the dark corners or is it actually the dark corners that can actually give you this gives you the joy of light so to speak mm -hmm. if it was all light then that's a bit dull thank you hugh thank you stephen so um maybe i could just ask a question uh i, I wondered what you would then make of the early friends in their bid to you know, uh, steer clear of opacity. I mean, do you feel they were misguided in their approach to scripture, or you know, just behind the behind what behind the times or of their time? Or um, well, it would, it would be hard to. Um, I th I think I've written somewhere anyway that what was interesting about early friends is that unlike many of the very diverse groups that grew out of the fact that once Protestantism had come on the scene and there was an idea that you could go back to the scriptures and the, Christ the scriptures were plain and clear and every plowboy could read them to his own uh, instruction and didn't need them mediated by the church, very quickly, you get the plethora of competing groups all saying, yeah, well, that's true, but the plain and simple sense is what we say it is, not what you say it is. And then you're in the interesting business of saying, well, we've got the Bible, we've all got the same Bible, we're not agreeing, what are we going to do? Well, either we can, either we can fight it out, literally, which, is, which happened more than and was quite comfortable for anybody or else we have to look for some other principle uh, by which we we adjudicate this and but there was a, a overarching view I think at the time it was just is is the nature of 
that kind of discourse at that period in the development of Western European writing, that what you had to do was demonstrate how what you say was so firmly fixed that it could stand beside Euclid's axioms. Oh. And that's not the fault of the early Quaker writers who were doing it. That was the, that, in fact, that's, it's part of the dialogic thing. I mean, you, there was no point in making an argument. Once you get into the argument, you have to make the argument in the other people's terms or else they can very easily just, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not speaking to us while we're listening to you. Mm -hmm. If you want to be listened to, you have to use the terms, but that means that your own, your own language suddenly becomes couched in the terms of the other. Your own questions disappear. Uh, it becomes their questions if you're not careful. It's the paradox of mm -hmm. post-colonialism as well, actually, really, you know, that, how do you explain to the conqueror, to the colonizer, who you are, except by using their language, in which case you're going to be using their categories. And, you know, that's one of the things that Gleason was, was trying to say, I think. Um, and, and I think all of them, uh, it's interesting to put his voice in because a voice that is critiquing assumptions that are so much part of the woodwork of, of the way that our, we are trained in Western history and, and philosophy. Thank you, Hugh. Well, is that an answer? I don't know. Yes, yes, that's a great <laughs> answer. Um, I can't see any other questions. Um, oh, Kevin Mortimer. Oh. It's probably the final question. Okay, oh, Kevin. gosh. Yeah, just <laughs> simply, um, Stephen Angel brought up Descartes. Would Descartes say that uh, Tolstoy more ident identified with Descartes or Kierkegaard as it relates to what you what you've been talking about? Mm. Yeah. I'm not sure that either Tolstoy or Kierkegaard would be entirely happy with the identification with Descartes, but it seems to me that, that Tolstoy, though he might very well grumble about it, um, is, is closer to that Cartesian attempt to, to comprehend understanding. Um, um, I mean, where, where Kierkegaard is different is that he certainly was very aware of, of Descartes and, uh, you know, had respect for him, but he was much more, he was much more interested in the doubt than the certainty. Now, of course, Descartes begins in doubt. That's what, you know, what is the thing I can't doubt? Well, that's where he gets to, I think, therefore I am, you know, I can doubt everything else but if I doubt that you know what are we even talking <laughs> you know, what are we even talking about whereas Kierkegaard was much more interested in saying well that is the response to that to um, try and dispel the clouds of doubt or do we have to find a way of seeing that the doubt is what's impelling us um, that it, you know, it takes us to the point where we have to make decisions and we realize we, we haven't got certainty because Descartes doesn't help you very much if you haven't worked it all out. You know, when you get to a gap, when you get to the gap that, of faith that, that Kierkegaard um, is very well aware of, um, you know, the Cartesian wants to build a bridge over it, but ultimately there's you don't know where the other end is you, you know it's very difficult to build a bridge from one end if you don't know where the other end is going to end up now i'm blethering but i hope that's some kind of response to what you you were asking thank you Hugh. thank you kevin um i'm, I'm not seeing uh, any other questions and um 
I'd just really like to thank you, Hugh, though, for giving us so much uh, to think about this evening and for treading that line between um, speaking in the way your hearers would want to uh, <laughs> Want you to say and you're keeping an integrity to your own questions so mm. thank you very much indeed and we'll give you a silent uh, round of applause thank you yeah. my pleasure so um as i say the recording will be um available later on the woodbrook website and the text or a, a version a text version of the lecture will appear in quaker studies Shortly, there will be all being well another George Richardson lecture next year, given by uh, Professor Angus Winchester, and we will be sending out details to those on the Centre for Research in Quaker Studies mailing list and the Quaker Studies Research Association mailing lists. But again, thank you very much, Hugh, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening from so many uh, different locations. It's really good to see you. So, and bye bye for now. Bye.